Kia ora, ko Aotukai Rahui, Whakatū Ranga Paumatua ki Tamana Whakatū, ko Caroline Toku Wingua. Hello, I'm Caroline Flora, the Chief Censor. Today we're going to be introducing you to Tamana Whakatū, the classification office, which turns 30 this year. We want to celebrate the work of the office, the important decisions we've made over the years, and the people that make those decisions. We're going to be speaking to two former Chief Censors and members of our Youth Advisory Panel. Well, Jane, thank you so much for joining us today. You were the eighth Chief Censor and the first female Chief Censor from 1991 until 1994 under the Films Act. Seems like a hundred years ago now, but it's only 30, so congratulations, we're still here. Most of what we do is classification and a huge amount of what we do is informing the public about what they're yeah. about to watch so they yeah. can make an empowered decision. How easy is that to do in 2024 when everybody is getting their information and content from lots of different places? It's a really good philosophical question because again, when I was um, the chief film censor, the internet had been barely invented, right? So I think it's a very good existential question for the office to ask. I think the classification work in particular, if it focuses more on children and young people, and an understanding of how their mental health is affected by various kinds of content. That is, the, I think, a key defensible purpose of the office. Kia ora AJ, thank you so much for coming back to Te Manifakatu to celebrate our 30 year anniversary. What inspired you to join the Youth Advisory Panel? Um, there wasn't really a big, huge, cool answer that I can give you other than just to give it a go. It's just simply a really cool opportunity to meet new people, but also to get really involved in a space that not, not a lot of young people actually really know, which is the classification system. And oh boy, it's been a really cool journey. So the law was changing to bring streaming services into our regulatory space and you as a Youth Advisory Panel member went down and spoke to the Select Committee about why this was really important for young people. What was that experience like? Oh, it was scary. <laughs> I woke up at 6am during that day, um, but it was really cool to be able to have the office sort of give us enough sort of support to be like, you guys got this, but really leaving that responsibility of sharing our perspective to us, the young people. Why do you think it's important that we listen to the voices of young people? I'm sure the office understands how important it is making the decision that's right, and but one that is informed and is backed up. I think it's really important to have young people at the table and be able to sort of share their piece. Kia ora David, thank you sure. so much for coming in. You were the 12th Chief Censor from 90, oh, sorry, from 2017. <laughs> You're going to age me. <laughs> from That's 2017 right. to 2022. Young people today are getting most of their content on their devices or at least online. And it doesn't come through this office for classification. So why is it so important that we have a strong communication approach with Fano and with young people? Back in the day, you could go down to the wharves and, and see, you know, crates of content coming off books or magazines or DVDs, VHS. There was, you know, a, an understood regulatory kind of check and balance process. Um, when you shift all of that to online, that doesn't work anymore having that communication, giving young people themselves some tools and information is a good start, giving families, parents some tools and information is key as well. Kia ora Rihanna, thank you so much for coming in and speaking with us. Thanks for having me. <laughs> You're a member of our Youth Advisory Panel and yes. you've been on the panel for over a year now. Why do you think it's so important that young people get good information about films and shows on streaming services. I didn't have that knowledge growing up. I feel like people don't realise how we're exposed to so much stuff and how that can harm us. One of our responsibilities here at the Classification Office is to communicate mm. with the New Zealand public and we do that through social media. Yeah. Why is it so important to get that right? I think having the voices of us, the Rangatahi and the youth panel, being able to talk to you guys about it and know what we like and what's going to make us more intrigued to watch and read things is really important. 
I'm really glad that I've also had a voice in being able to help you guys and your social media <laughs> presence as well. Like one time, me and one of the other youth panel people, we just sat down and like flamed, <laughs> um, like get the reels that you guys were gonna post. And like, you cannot post this, like no one's gonna watch this. We really appreciate it, <laughs> very direct feedback. Yeah. Thank you. It's okay. What are you most proud of in your time as Chief Censor, Jane? I was proud that given with my media background, I managed to have, I think, a little bit of influence around the freedom of expression space. Start off with freedom of expression, and then you move back to the point where um, censorship actually starts. And if you don't do that, then you haven't got a particularly functioning um, democracy, I don't think. <laughs> well, thank you for that, because that um, we work under the 1993 legislation today, and that's exactly how we work. Yeah. We start with freedom of expression and it, it, um, we're here to uphold it. Have they still got that funny list of sexual deviancies in the Act? There are a few. <laughs> Normally to I just think that was terribly funny at the time. <laughs> Normally to test whether the publication's going to be objectionable yes, or not. Yes. We do encourage the public to actually have a look at the tests in the legislation because the things that would meet the test for being banned under the 1993 legislation, in my view, have stood the test of time. It's at a very, very high threshold. The sexual content that gets banned today is because it involves children yeah. or sexual assault. So it really is that very unsurprising list of things that would make yeah, the criteria. Yeah, yeah. But sexual assault's also a really tough one, right? In the porn space, relatively easy. In the mainstream space, not quite so much when it's yeah. in the hands of a really talented director who knows exactly how to terrify you to death. <laughs> Interesting. And when you look at the kind of content that's come out, particularly in the streaming services, the Scandi Noirs, the serial killer stuff, all fabulously made. But it must give you pause for thought, I would think. It does, and it really goes to why the expertise of this office is so necessary because it isn't just a snap judgment, mm. it's applying the legislation, it's often getting community involvement, it's looking at the latest research about content harm and then overlaying that ultimately with freedom of expression and really good content warnings. Yeah, one of the things I really enjoyed was the community consultations that we did on the, on the tough stuff usually. I had two classification officers and me, right, so just three of us. And when you're looking at a certain kind of material, then I think sometimes you lose perspective. And so getting in um, a range of different people who have a range of views to chew through a piece of content, I always found really helpful. Why do you think it's really important that we reach young people directly rather than through schools or through their parents? Young people are very different now compared to like past, you know, years back. Um, so we're in a whole different space and some approaches needs to be updated, needs to be modernised, it needs to be able to work with the times. Um, social media is kind of the new thing that a lot of young people are going on. It's really important to engage with them. Mm, and if you could have a message for young people in 2024 about engaging with content, what would it be? Find a rating. <laughs> Check the Find a Rating website. Awesome. Um, you don't want any harm inflicted on them. So what's the best way is to at least give them the information they need that they can feel empowered um, to make a decision like, is this right for me? David, in your time as Chief Censor, what are you most proud of? Turning this office into very much more an outwardly engaged and interactive agency, going down to Parliament and seeing members of the Youth Advisory Panel talking to Select Committee about how actually regulation and law needed to be changed in a way that would help them and yet just seeing how the office could respond in that aftermath of March 15th mm. was, was also humbling really. You had a really significant event involving technology and then a change of the law during your time. The 2019 attacks on two mosques in Christchurch. Can you reflect on that a That's little? That's right. Well, that was an incredibly significant event for the, for the country as a whole, obviously. For this office in particular, that was an extraordinary situation where the material that we ultimately deemed was objectionable was spread all across everyone's devices and social media. We'd never before had to engage with something 
to classify it at that really high end of the scale that had been seen by so many people. But I was so proud of the office in terms of its response, how quickly we wrapped around that, dealt with the challenges, and communicated as clearly as we could to everyone we're engaged with and the population as a whole. 13 Reasons Why mm. was a, a catalyst and you might not be surprised to know that after three years of operating that regime where we regulate streaming providers, 55,000 titles have been self-rated in Aotearoa. Wow. What, what did that mean at the time to you to bring in a whole different way of regulating content? Oh, look, that, that was, it felt so important for me, 55,000 pieces of content. So you think about what that would mean in terms of an office doing a traditional classification review process to deliver that. How much money would that cost? How big would the office be? You can't keep up with the incredible speed and delivery of these um, streaming services. So that to me was a glimpse at the future by thinking in new ways about how we can solve old problems using new approaches. And we're turning 30 this year. Yeah, woo! <laughs> what do you hope our work looks like over the next 5, 10, 30 years? Having this panel and um, is such a great step already. I think that being us being more involved would be a great thing as well in the next 5, 10, 30 years, so yeah. What message would you give to young people about choosing content to watch? Definitely research, having that knowledge before going into and watching those things is just really impactful and they can decide whether or not it's good for them because I think it's such a broad thing because like you don't, one person can think it's fine and the other person can be extremely harmed by it. Given we're celebrating 30 years, do you have any messages for the team that's in Manafakatu? Yes. Thank you uh, to Manafakatu for everything. It was my first ever professional role um, and I'm eternally grateful. David, what messages do you have for the staff at Manafakatu as we mark 30 years? Oh look, I would just say thank you so much. Working here was incredibly rewarding and it was because of the people. The capability and willingness to stand up and grapple with some huge issues. The team was hugely up to that task. I was so grateful for that and keep up the good work.